And our special guest tonight, G. Edward Griffin and his special book, Creature from Jekyll Island. And we'll get into that in just a moment. Floating format tonight. So we're starting our main guest this hour, last hour of the program, several hours from now. We go live to the United Kingdom with Lionel Fenthorpe, the greatest storyteller ever born. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. We're with Ed Griffin. Ed, uh, Ron Paul was my guest last week for a few minutes as we talked about his measures to get uh, some control of the Federal Reserve and audit. And uh, he's a champion, and of course, he loves your book, calling it a superb analysis. And he says, be prepared for one heck of a journey through time and mind. And he's right. I'm very grateful for Ron for giving me a a good plug like that. But uh, Ron is one of the very few um, politicians that you can depend that he's telling you the truth when he speaks. We hear about Warren Buffett and how rich he is and Bill Gates and how rich he is. How can we never hear about the Rothschilds and how rich they are? Are they richer than these two guys? Uh, Well, I don't really know, but my guess would be that they're many times more wealthy than these uh, people. And in fact, that was our topic at the uh, break, Uh, the fact that the Rothschilds really became very powerful internationally by uh, staying in the shadows as much as possible. And they worked through uh, front groups. Uh, J.P. Morgan in the United States, it turns out after many years, we find out that Morgan was really more or less just a, a, a mouthpiece or a front office for the Rothschilds in England. And it's an amazing thing to discover that. But in, as you probably know, uh, George, that one of the things the Rothschilds had to face uh, a couple hundred years ago is that uh, there was a lot of anti-Semitism in Europe. And a lot of uh, companies just wouldn't do business with the Rothschilds. This was certainly true in the United States. And so uh, they, uh, the Rothschilds struck a deal with J.P. Morgan, uh, who was thought to be quite anti-Semitic. But it turns out that Morgan and Rothschild were working very closely behind the scenes so that people who didn't want to deal with those uh, Jewish bankers, the Rothschilds, they could go to those uh, good anti-Semitic bankers, J.P. Morgan, <laughs> and, uh, and Morgan would pass the, the deal back to the Rothschilds and they'd work it out together. Well, you know, you, you cannot really fault that kind of a strategy when you consider the era in which uh, it, the strategy was developed. So uh, the Rothschilds had a, a long history of being behind the scenes and not recognized as, as being the, the kingpins that they were. How did the Federal Reserve get formed? What happened? How did the scam begin? Well, that's quite an interesting story, and probably that's where we should begin for a lot of people mm-hmm. that don't know it. Um, the reason that I called my book The Creature from Jekyll Island as, well, there are a couple of reasons. Uh, you know, as a writer, you've always got to come up with a tricky title for your book. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, people won't want to read it. And I had, I had a lot of fun thinking that uh, this book, because it sounded mysterious, you know, I had the creature from the Black Lagoon. And for this show, Ed, it's perfect, let <laughs> it's me tell perfect. you. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I thought if, if ever anybody saw it in a bookstore, they might think it was a sequel to Jurassic Park. That's right. And uh, buy it. And so, well, anyway, that was a half uh, in jest. But I did want a tricky title, but in this case, it's more than just a, an interesting title. The creature from Jekyll Island has significance because the Federal Reserve System was created on Jekyll Island. Now, that's a real island. It's off the coast of Georgia, and it was on that island back in 1910 that the Federal Reserve System was hammered out in all of the important details. Well, that's interesting in itself, but we find out that the island was privately owned in those days by a small group of billionaires from New York. And we're talking about uh, people like J.P. Morgan, uh, William Rockefeller, and their business associates. They called it the Jekyll Island Club, and it was a, a resort, and it's where the the families of the super wealthy went to spend the cold winter months to get away from New York. And they have a beautiful clubhouse there, which is still standing if you want to go visit it. In fact, I was just there about four or five weeks ago for a seminar, hmm. and we actually had lunch in the very room <laughs> where the Federal Reserve System was created. Jeez. Yeah. Well, the thing is that these, uh, these men went to Jekyll Island to create the Federal Reserve System system 
because they wanted to be away from the prying eyes of reporters and uh, commentators and uh, general observers. Which they would have gotten in D.C. Oh, they certainly no would have gotten in D.C. or New York or any place. As a matter of fact, I, uh, when I got into the research, I found out that there was a great deal of secrecy surrounding this meeting, and so much secrecy that, uh, in my opinion, I doubt if there were many wars of history that were plotted under conditions of greater secrecy. Uh, for example, when uh, the seven men who we're talking about uh, assembled, they were told to go, uh, this was November of 1910, they were told to go to the New Jersey Railroad Station late at night, where they were to, uh, uh, they were to get on board the private railroad car of Senator Nelson Aldridge. And they were told to come to the station one at a time, not to be seen together, not to dine together, to avoid newspaper reporters at all costs and all that sort of thing. One of the men carried a shotgun with him in a big black case. So in case he had been asked where he was going, he was prepared to say that he was going on a duck hunting trip. Ah. Yeah. Well, that's particularly interesting later because we find out from his biographers and uh, from his children who wrote about this in later years that this man didn't even own a gun. He borrowed that particular <laughs> gun. He'd never fired one in his life, and it was just part of the general deception. Yeah. And, and when they got on board this private railroad car, they were then instructed to address each other using first names only, not to use their last names. And two of the men even abandoned their first names and used code names while speaking to each other in the privacy of a railroad car. And we find out later, because one of these men wrote about it in later years in the Saturday Evening Post, and he said the reason for that was they were concerned that the servants on board the train might find out who all of these people were. Of course, they knew who Senator Aldrich was because they worked for him. And they might have known the identity of one or possibly two of the others, but they didn't know all of them. And they were afraid that if the servants would talk, that these particular men and tell their friends that these particular men had all gone and met together, that then, of course, the, the word would have been out and the purpose of the, uh, of the conflab would have been subverted. So anyway, they got on board this private railroad car, and they, they traveled for two nights and a day, a thousand-mile journey down to uh, Brunswick, New Jersey, where they got off and then took a ferry boat across the inland straits to Jekyll Island, and then to this magnificent clubhouse, and they sat around a table in the room that I mentioned a moment ago where we had lunch, and for a week they hammered out all the details of what became the Federal Reserve Act when it was passed into law three years later. And I bet they had one heck of a time there for that I week. bet they drank a little good whiskey and smoked some cigars. And did other things, and did sure. it, But they were there uh, for business. They were there to create a Federal Reserve System, and they were deadly serious about it. Um, now, just let me just finish the story here. They went finally back to New York and disappeared into the environs of Wall Street. And it's interesting to know that for quite a while thereafter, they denied that they ever went to such a meeting. They said, that's absurd. That's, uh, that's a conspiracy theory, although I don't think they used those words in those days. Yeah, but they we, kinda, we use them now. We use them now. But they kind of scoffed at anybody that thought that that happened. And it wasn't until after the Federal Reserve System was passed into law and eventually became revered by the citizenry as a great American institution, only then did they begin to come out and say, yep, we went, this is what we did. And then they began to boast about it. And uh, so now, after they writ some of these guys have, had written some books on it, their biographers have written about it, their families written about it, and so forth. You can go to any well-stocked library today and learn in great detail what they did at Jekyll Island and why they went and so forth. Prior to 1910, what's our monetary system in this country and how are things economically functioning? Well, that's a good question because it leads right to the issue of why the secrecy for this meeting. Mm -hmm. Prior to 1910, uh, the country was in uh, pretty bad straits. Uh, each state uh, of the Union had its own laws regarding banking. And in every case, uh, they had formed little monopolies at the state level, and the legislatures of the states had given the banks special privileges to, to, uh, to literally violate their contract with depositors.